When I found out I had diabetes, I honestly thought I was going to die. But the fact is, I didn't know anything about diabetes. All I knew was that it was a disease for older people. That's a lie. Actually, you can live longer with diabetes. The best thing to do is to educate yourself. Go see a doctor now. Don't hesitate. Don't procrastinate. Choose to live. Now, diabetes is the fastest growing chronic condition in South Africa, and all types of diabetes are increasing in prevalence. Approximately 3.8 million South Africans live with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Now, the sad part of all of this is that half of those with diabetes remain undiagnosed. The global prevalence of adult diabetes has nearly doubled. Diabetes is also the ninth leading cause of death in women globally, causing 2.1 million deaths each year. Now, World Diabetes Day is observed on the 14th of November 2017. And this year's theme is Women and Diabetes. So today we discuss diabetes. We'll focus on all aspects of diabetes, including impact, causes, risk factors, prevention, treatment, and support. Now, we'll be joined in studio first by an endocrinologist and the Deputy Director of Non-Communicable Diseases from the National Department of Health, a diabetic nurse educator, um, assistant director from the National Department of Health, a representative from Diabetes Support Group in FOIS, and we also have a child diabetes sufferer to share her story with us. Now, joining us from Cape Town or Western Cape, somewhere in the Western Cape, will be the chief scientist from the South African Medical Research Council, and we're also joined by a studio audience, all of whom either have diabetes or are affected by the condition in some way or another. Now, you maybe want to be part of this show by asking the panel some questions or simply just sharing the view, your views with us. In that case, the number to call is 714-6918 or 6919. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. So sit back, relax, and learn from this bumper show ahead. Come to you, coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Salom Daung, and this is Health Talk. MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. It's so good, nothing else can replace, just your slightest embrace. And if you only would be my own all the rest of my day, I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Bon. A lot of us rely on tech to survive, and Africa is already a mobile first continent. We build a mobile technology that connects motorcycle taxis to commuters and businesses in real time. My phone was that the most important thing. Africans are using technology to innovate. On network, we have African technology and social media news. Even robots have heard about us. Hello, watch network on SIBC. For African technology and social media news, join Ms. Pumela Lezondi on network every Sunday at 9 p.m. In 2016, diabetes jumped up the Statistics SA causes of death rankings in South Africa to the second largest underlying cause of natural death after TB. But many people are still in denial because of myths that diabetes affects only old people, fat people, and those who consume too much sugary foods. There was blood in my urine and then um, I immediately went to the doctor. and. I got told my blood sugars were on 
28 or something ridiculous like that. So I didn't know then what they were talking about. And it wasn't alarming. See, because I didn't know anything about diabetes. Those diagnosed with diabetes need nothing short of the best available health care. I learned, yeah, uh, uh, the hardest lessons. Uh, I passed out, I lost a lot of weight. Um, I would say I was depressed, you know. Um, and then I had to educate myself about diabetes. According to Romeo Malepe, self-management education is limited and the role of diabetic nurse educators is underplayed. A further problem is the high cost of treatments in both the private and the public sectors. I went to a doctor. Uh, I, had my, I did my blood tests, everything. And yeah, immediately I had to start using insulin, injecting myself. And even that was a challenge because I, I was afraid of needles and I'm still afraid of needles, but uh, I have to inject myself probably like four times a day with this illness. Uh, and um, I've changed my lifestyle totally. I, 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 I go to the gym, uh, I eat healthy, Sometimes I can't lose track. I'm, I'm a human being. You know, I'll have one odd muffin uh, here and there. I feel like even now, even after eight years of living with diabetes, I, I don't think there's enough education pieces or even a discussion around diabetes. Uh, I think... I think... <sighs> Diabetes education is an emergency. Malepe has taken steps to drive the message about the diabetes pandemic. I run an NGO called Suikiri Diabetes and I try my best to put out knowledge about uh, diabetes through, through Suikiri Dotsiolozere. And um, it's working, but those who don't have diabetes don't take it seriously. But I do know that everyone has someone in their family who has diabetes and that, that should be alarming as most people only begin to look after their health when they have a scare it is of utmost importance to note that once you are diagnosed with diabetes you need to take your treatment regularly monitor your sugar levels live a healthy lifestyle including diet and exercise for the rest of your life all right, let's unpack the subject of diabetes a little more with, our, uh, first up, our two special guests, um, uh, Dr. Sindeep Bana. Uh, Dr. Bana is an, an, a specialist endocrinologist who's head of endocrin endocrinology based at Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital and is also a lecturer um, at Vets University. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Bana. Thank you for having me. All right, and with Dr. Bana is Dr. Uh, Itumeleng Sitlari, who's Deputy Director of Non-Communicable Diseases from the National Department of Health. Welcome to Health Talk. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mutagung, and good morning to the viewers at home. All right, <clears throat> let's, let's start with you, Dr. Bana. Um, diabetes, what are we talking about? What is diabetes in simple terms? So, it's a disease with sugar, and there's a few types. But I think the three main types that we need to concentrate about is type 1 diabetes. And this is a case where the pancreas stops making insulin. The beta cell stops making it because it's either attacked by a cell, it's an autoimmune condition, or it's idiopathic where it stops working. And this is mainly the type of diabetes that will affect the young. Mm. Type 2 diabetes is one of insulin resistance. So the hormone that controls or directs sugar is insulin. And the body cells stop listening to the insulin. So they become resistant to it. Yeah. And that's the one that is mainly related to lifestyle. And of mm. course, certain medications can augment or worsen it. Mm. And then gestational diabetes. Um, it's when a pregnant patient either develops diabetes during a pregnancy mm. or a patient with diabetes develop, uh, obviously falls pregnant and then we've got to manage the diabetes through. Okay. The worrying thing is all three of them mm. are increasing at an alarming rate throughout the world. We're going to come back to talk about, you know, how common these are. But let's invite some comment from our guest in the Western Cape, Professor Christo Miller, 
who is a chief scientist at the South African Medical Research Council. Now, Prof. Mella, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you very much, Doctor. All Thank right. you. By the way, Prof. Mella is joining us via Skype. Now, we hear, Prof. Mella, that you know, there's, there's now type 3 diabetes that not too many people know about. Just tell us a little bit about this. What is type 3 yes. diabetes? Yes, so type 3 diabetes is a lesser known um, diabetes. It's a form of diabetes that represents a progressive type 2 diabetes, which is specifically associated with neurodegeneration and dementia, of which Alzheimer's disease is, of course, the best known. So, so uh, are we saying... Is it there is a link between... The, uh, the increased risk of dementia and type, type 2 diabetes and obesity. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We, we, we're going to come back to that. So, so are you saying, is it just an association between type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's, or is it a recognized type 3 diabetes? Yeah. Uh, so if we look at um, type 2 diabetes, um, the classical neuro fibrillary tangles associated with uh, Alzheimer type dementia is not increased in type 2 diabetes, right. suggesting that additional processes drive the path pathogenesis of the Alzheimer type neurodegeneration. All right. And okay. in this context, several mechanisms have been identified in the brain. Okay. All right. And, and just, just out of interest, how common is this type 3 diabetes? Well, as, as you know, the, the incidence of, of uh, Alzheimer's, for example, I think is about 200,000 in South Africa, and it's expected to increase by 50%. Or, so it's a very prevalent uh, disease. All right. Okay. Let's come back to Jobek and speak to our guests here. Um, perhaps let's start with you, uh, Mellon. We hear that, you know, the burden of diabetes and non-communicable diseases in general is really engulfing this country and perhaps, you know, the rest of the world. Just tell us, or give us a sense of, from the department's perspective, what is the burden of diabetes like in the country? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mutawung. Uh, yeah, like what the doctor said uh, just some few minutes ago, diabetes is on the increase. And uh, most of the people are starting to have diabetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons that makes people to develop diabetes is because uh, we have the modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. Mm -hmm. And the modifiable risk factors, people are not like uh, taking, th taking them to so hard. Yeah. They are not like um, doing what they are supposed to do. They are so, not so essentially what you're saying, because we're going to come back and describe yes. what those modifiable and non-modifiable factors are. But essentially you're saying we're seeing more and more of diabetes because of these risk factors that are prevalent. Exactly. Exactly. Dr. Bana, let's come back to you know, describe how is this condition diagnosed? Is, are there typical signs and symptoms perhaps? Yeah, so there's a cluster of symptoms. These patients will complain of excessive thirst. Um, they'll pass a lot of urine. Um, they lose weight. There's fatigue. Um, mentation gets affected as well. Uh, earlier in your segment, uh, the ad spoke about the patient feeling depressed. So those are the hallmarks. It's uh, weight loss, uh, excessive thirst, and passing a lot of urine. Mm. And of course, with type 2 diabetes, if there's a family history, then that should alert the patient to getting diagnosed as well. So the diagnosis is basically made uh, by a doctor or a nurse or any of the screening mobile uh, days that are available throughout the country where patient needs to test their glucose or sugar levels. But, but okay, you, you mentioned, I mean, you described these symptoms now. I mean, is it... Are, are, are these present in all cases of diabetes? Because there's this talk that half the people are walking around with diabetes or they, they don't yes. know. Yeah? So obviously the patient with the type 1 diabetes, the younger patient, the presentation is a lot more catastrophic and it's acute. So, uh, you know, the one day they're fine and then the next two or three days uh, they're extremely sick. And of course, if untreated, the patient can present in a 
diabetic coma as well, uh, acidotic coma. Whereas your type 2 patient, uh, remember they start off being a bit more heavy and more obese anyway. And so yes, they do lose a bit of weight, but it's a moderate amount. And the main hallmark is polyuria, polydipsia, with excessive thirst, passing a lot of urine. But that can be um, construed as being caused by other things, or the patient will typically tell you, oh, it's because I'm drinking a lot of water. Mm. Um, so these are subtle. So I think the key thing is, if there's a family history, uh, if you're not feeling well, if you've got any of the symptoms, it's always worthwhile <coughs> getting yourself screened. Yeah. And that will obviously be a blood test. Is it is this a condition of the older people? We hear now that, you know, we're getting children suffering from diabetes. What's happening here? I, I mean, is it, is it getting worse? Is it affecting more children? Where, where do we see it more? Yeah, now lately we see now the trend is kind of like changing. Then uh, like from your adolescent are also now starting to to develop diabetes. Previously, we used to have more older people getting, especially with type two, like what the doctor said. I mean, the type one is, is, a bit, is a bit different from type two. Mm. But type two, we saw most adult people getting it. But now lately, uh, the trend is changing as because we are starting to see your adolescent, young people starting to get it. Mm. So, so is that the case? I mean, yes. I, I remember the old terminology in the past of so-called adult onset diabetes. Yes, and, and we've got to throw that term away now right. because with an increase in obesity and the prevalence is going up at an exponential rate, yeah. uh, certainly in our schools, one of the propositions a few years ago was to get rid of PE. So we're actually telling our society it's okay to be less active. So less activity, foods having a lot of sugar, refined carbohydrates, mm. Uh, certainly so all the of risk. these things we're going to come yeah. to, but, mm -hmm. but what does it mean to be diagnosed with diabetes? Is it, what's, what's the prognosis? Is it, does it, is it curable? So, look, I mean, you know, type 1 diabetes at the moment is not curable. I mean, we're looking at, in the future, uh, a regeneration of beta cells, but that's still uh, quite a distance away. But it's, these conditions are manageable. Mm -hmm. Type 2 diabetes, certainly, if you pick it up early, it can be reversed with uh, lifestyle. So there was a nice study, the Newcastle study showed 11 diabetic patients with diabetes for more than five years on insulin. Remember, this is type 2 diabetes. Mm. They went on a strict diet, 500 calories, exercise program, and within three months they reversed it. Mm. Now that is not easy to try and achieve. Right. But it is something that you're going to have to always manage. Right. And it's not the end of the world. I mean, I just lost my mother-in-law uh, two days ago. But she lived with type 1 diabetes for 40 years with no complications. Yeah. So, so the message is that it is okay. manageable. Yeah. Okay. I think it's on this note that we should break um, just for a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we try and understand why is it that people are getting diabetes, you know, the causes and risk factors, and perhaps understand what it is like to live with diabetes. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. It's so good, nothing else can replace just your slightest embrace. And if you only would be my own for the rest of my day. I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Pong. I feel the real prison. <laughs> and it's nutritious and delicious. It's good, I really like it. This celebrates being South African. We love our beer, we love our food, we love our music. So for, for knowing who are going, you must know where you come from. I'm excited uh, to be part of this this year. For all your travel trends, catch us every Sunday, 12 midday on Channel 404.
Welcome back. We're talking diabetes and with me in the studio is Dr. Sindeep Banner, endocrinologist and um, yeah, head of endocrinology at Chris Harry Paragonath Hospital and lecturer at Virts University and of course uh, Itumelen Sitlare, Deputy Director, Non-Communicable Diseases from the National Department of Health. Now we're joined by a very special guest now, uh, a young lady um, called Bedison Bell who is a child sufferer. Medicine, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you. All right, tell us, tell us about yourself. How old are you? I'm nine. Nine years old. Hmm. So why are you here? I believe you have diabetes. Yes. Ah, uh -huh. tell us about it. When, when, did you, when were you diagnosed with this condition? When I was five years old. Right. What happened to you then? Were you sick or what happened? The night before, I just started to drink my drink water and everything in five minutes. I used to go to the bathroom like eight times. Right. Okay, so mommy took you to the doctor. Yes. Okay, and then the, you were told you have diabetes. Yeah. I suppose you didn't know what that meant to you then, hey? So, so tell us now how, how it is like, how is it like to live with this condition? How are you, you, do you inject yourself? Do you have to inject yourself? Well, I have an eye port and then it goes into my skin and then I inject into that. All right, and you were told what, you do know what type of diabetes you have, hey? Yes. What type? Type 1. Type 1, okay. And how is it to have diabetes, playing around with your schoolmates, does it affect you in any way? No, it's just hard with my diet. Tell us, tell us about that now. Are you, are, are you restricted from eating certain foods? Sometimes. I'm just on low carb. We have tried different things, but now that I'm on low carb, I feel a lot better. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. Now, this is very interesting. You know that all the low-carb foods, the common ones that you take, which ones are those? Basically, it's just meat. Just meat. Okay. That's very nice. And to play around, to play sport. Yes. Okay. How often do you see your doctor? About once a month. About once a month. And how would you describe yourself? Are you now healthy? You're a happy kid? I'm healthy and I'm happy. We do have, sometimes I am a little bit sick, but then yeah. it's not like heavy sick, but... Do you tell your friends about diabetes at school? Yes. It's very good, very good. Well, Dr. Bala, this is a classical example of yes. seeing diabetes early on. Just now we're saying, you know, um, we're seeing it at children. Do you want to comment perhaps on, on yeah, medicine? So, now? of course, uh, children like medicine are very brave. I mean, uh, to, you know, to live with uh, type 1 diabetes, um, is actively having to work on it all the time. Mm, mm. So we, we find when children are diagnosed younger, it's easier to manage the condition by right. themselves and for the doctor and the diabetic educator. Right. It's when it happens around the teenage years, that's when we... Becomes a bit with, more difficult. Be, yeah, becomes a bit more difficult because then you almost feel like, why me? And, uh, you know, you mm. can't do a lot of things. Whereas when you get it very young, it becomes part of... Yeah. daily routine but yeah. it, it's work it's she, medicine she, she's produce, quite yeah. comfortable and she's and happy she's dealing with it quite well yes. all right let's just take two calls one after the other first is petronella from cape town petronella welcome to health talk hello thanks for welcoming me yes petronella um my question my question is my grandparents which my granddad is the one that has diabetes right so he also injected insulin and my aunt, which is a second born, has recently been diagnosed with diabetes. But my mom, which is a second born, is still not diagnosed. So my question is, what are the chances that I will also be diagnosed with diabetes, either, either now or later on in life? Great question. Thank you so much for that question. Let's take Brian on the line from Johannesburg. Brian, welcome. Hello. Go um, ahead, Brian. I'm 57 years old, and I'm on... Humalog Mix 25. Yes. I've only been a diabetic since 2012. Right. And of late, I seem to be gaining weight excessively. Right. Okay, and you want to know why, basically? Yes, that's All right. why my doctor could not answer me on that. He says it's just something that is a norm with me. All right, let's get the doctor to answer. Thank you so much for your questions. Perhaps let's start with, with Petronella. With Petronella, yeah. And, and it links to what we're talking about. What are the risk factors? Yes. Yeah? 
So, I mean, she wanted to know what her risk factors are, basically. So, yes, there are certain people that are more at risk of developing diabetes from an ethnic group perspective. So, in South Africa, it would be the South African Indians that have the highest incidence, about around a prevalence of 13%. Um, the general prevalence in South Africa used to be around 5%. We think it's moving more towards 8 and 9% now. And so... Uh, there's definitely an increase. In Petronella's case, obviously, if there's a family history, we normally say if there's one parent, you know, you've got about a 40% chance of developing it. Uh, if you're Indian, you've got two parents, you're looking at uh, 70 to 80% risk. Mm. But obviously, that risk can be modified by lifestyle, and that's Correct. the thing. So the, the earlier you pick up that you might be at risk, it's modifiable. So Petronella right. should be exercising. So she, she needs to just, you know... She needs uh, to be stay exercising. Tuned exactly. and we'll talk about we'll talk all of those about. issues. And, Shall and, we do with Brian? Yeah. Okay, so Brian was diagnosed with the diabetes five years ago in 2012, so that was around 52. Mm. If he's been put on insulin from then, it means either his glucose levels were very high on presentation and his HbA1c, which is the average sugar level in the body for the last three months, was probably in excess of around 12. And so the doctors probably thought he wasn't going to be well controlled just on oral tablets. Mm. That being said, all patients with type 2 diabetes should be on metformin mm. unless they have a side effect to it, which is rare. Mm. Because that is directly addressing the insulin resistance, the pathology. Mm. The insulin and the SUs are just trying to get more insulin on board to manage the glucose level. But now, we've got a whole array of medications that have come through. All right, we want to talk market. about that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm going to be coming to the studio to just get some, some, some of them to just share their stories with us. But before that, let's speak to you, uh, Ita Melen. Um, clearly, uh, diabetes or non-communicable diseases in general have, have an impact on healthcare services. Do you want to just perhaps comment on that? Yeah, thanks. You know, um, the non-communicable diseases kind of like, uh, they, they increase the consumption of non-communicable diseases uh, 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 resources. resources yeah. Like for an example, um, if we have more people developing these non-communicable diseases, we are going to need more doctors. Right. We are going to need more nurses. Right. We are going to uh, run more tests. And all those things have financial implications. Right. Given the fact that uh, the resources of our country are not enough and we are having so many competing, competing needs, uh, the money that maybe could have been used for something then will need to be diverted to take care of non-communicable diseases. I mean, the, even the competitiveness of the country yeah. is going to be affected because people are not going to go to work because they will not be well. Productivity is going to be affected. Yeah. Treasury so, is going so, to be affected. There won't be any taxes. I mean, yeah. so they affect it over exactly, financial, exactly. Financial in the country. Yeah. yeah. All right. May, perhaps before I speak to the others, you know, um, this brave girl here, medicine, has a mum, Michelle, and I'd like to just get a sense from Michelle what it meant for you to have a child with diabetes. Our lives did change. It did a bit of a 360. Uh, when she was diagnosed, I heard it, but I didn't register exactly what it meant until we spent that entire week in hospital and I was just you know, shown to the endocrinologist, shown to the dietitian, and having to actually deal with what it meant in terms of care. Right. Um, you know, schooling started becoming a bit of a worry because I need to find a school that will take on that responsibility during the day because mm. I was hell-bent that she would live a normal childhood. That is our biggest thing in this life. Do you yourself have diabetes or anybody else in the family? No, we don't. Right. But you're coping well? We are coping. You know, right. I went through a period of denial. I got over it. She told me to stop it. I stopped it. And She's <laughs> a brave not girl. Dealing with it. She is very brave. Very, very, very proud. Okay, let's hear from somebody else now who is living with diabetes, yeah? Um, I Just got think your name. Oh, sorry. My name's Monique. Um, I got diagnosed when I was about 10 years old. My sugar level was 69.8. Um, it was the highest recording in the country, actually, at that time. It's actually, I feel that the first few years of being diagnosed when I was a lot younger, my mom had a lot more control over it. So it was a lot easier for me to control. But as the doctor said, as soon as you get into your teen years, you actually 
lose a lot of control in which I did. And about five years ago, I also found out that I only have one kidney, and I was born that way. And that's also taken a big part in it, and it's also had to make me change my lifestyle around completely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is very difficult to live with, and it is you, you do go through a very depressive stage, but I'm coming out stronger than ever. So mm. what, yeah. what sort of medication are you on? I'm on long-acting Lantus and short-acting Apidra. So I take my long-acting twice a day, morning and night, and then Apidra throughout the day, depending on what I eat and depending on my sugar levels. If I'm sick, it can just spark. If I'm stressed, it just sparks. If I'm happy, it can just go low. So you actually really never know. <laughs> you never know. So, so, so the bottom line is that you're living very well with your condition. Yeah, at the moment I am. The last... I would say before this year, the last three years have been really difficult. Mm -hmm. I was losing a bit of control going through my teen years. Everyone's drinking around me and smoking and carrying on. So obviously, not, not, that, it's, not that it's a cool thing to drink. Not, not that it's a cool thing to do, but you obviously yeah. feel like you need to do it. So I did go through the stage, but now I'm really looking after myself and getting control over it again. All right. Yeah. I'd like to hear more stories, but unfortunately, we have to go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, we continue our discussion on diabetes, focus on prevention, and perhaps, yes, hear more stories about people living with diabetes. Please stay with us. It's so good, nothing else can replace Just your slightest embrace And if you only would Be my own For the rest of my day I will whisper this phrase My darling Ceci Pong MedShield. Embracing our members in good health since 1968. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill. We'll help you stay well. The Law Society has slammed notices sent to four universities to jack up standards or risk losing their LLB courses. The Council on Higher Education issued a stern warning to the universities to conform within six months. I think it will affect the university. I think uh, um, outside, the, uh, outside the law faculty there's a funding issue. It's been 112 years since Enoch Sontonga died as a relatively unknown composer, choir master and teacher. But today his legacy lives on through his greatest composition, Ngosi Sigeleli Africa. For all your news updates, stay tuned to Your World from Monday to Sunday. Welcome back. You're watching Health Talk and we're talking diabetes and we have, you know, studio guests and of course a studio audience. And uh, we have Dr. Cindy Banner, endocrinologist. And we're now joined by Sister Charmaine Moyo, the lady in the middle. Uh, Sister Moyo is a diabetic or diabetes nurse educator. Welcome to Health Talk, uh, Sister Thank Charmaine. Thank you. Right. And next to uh, Charmaine, we have Nolene Naika, who is assistant director um, in nutrition. the nutrition Department at the National Department of Health. Welcome to Health Talk. Nadia. Thank you very much. All right. Before we, and of course we still have Prof. Miller, um, who will be joining us just now um, from on, on Skype from the Western Cape. But before we ask Dr. Miller to comment, let's just talk principles around prevention of diabetes. <laughs> All right. So prevention of type 2 diabetes will be centered around lifestyle stuff. So mm. it's about food, which I'm sure yeah. they're going to cover. And then, of course, level of activity. 
Yeah. So as a nation, we've become a lot uh, less active now, mainly right. because you know of uh, the kind of occupations that are available now. Most of us are behind desks, uh, not as active. So all of my patients get told they need to do at least 10,000 steps a day, whether it's right. walking the dog, whether it's walking around So it's the about block. Li lifestyle. It's about lifestyle. And then, of course, the dietary aspects. Which okay. Shemaine, we'll so, you spend quite a bit of your time teaching people or educating people about diabetes. Yes. The message around prevention, what is it that you spread? Okay, so as doctor has mentioned, it, you need to manage it uh, via lifestyle changes. So when we talk about exercise, uh, we talk about the different intensity um, ways of exercise. So there's passive up to aggressive. So when you talk passive, I talk to my patients that uh, will tell me they have knee problems or they have back problems, they can't walk or they feel pain when they walk. So I'll just tell them to do passive exercise, which is exercising while you're sitting. So you lift your feet up and down, <coughs> keep them in the air for some time, take water bottles, use that as weights, and lift up and down. This you can so do while you're watching TV. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, when it comes to um, aggressive exercise, looking at the children, we do have children now that have type 2 diabetes, and because kids spend most of the time behind the video games or behind cell phones so they're not exercising they don't go out and play it's very important for them to play yeah. so they need to be encouraged to play when you go to the mall park further and walk right. towards the door and stuff like that <coughs> okay all right Nalin, i'm going to be asking you about i mean look we've just heard that literally diabetes or non-communicable diseases are gripping this country what are we doing about it? But before you respond, let's take Lynn from KwaZulu Natal. Lynn, welcome to Health Talk. Hello, it's nice to be on, and I'm really finding everything that you say very um, uh, helpful. I was diagnosed, diagnosed with diabetes on the 10th of October. I had 32 with my count, and now I am on 6.1, and it's just through diet and exercise. But what I want to ask is, I have a craving for lemon meringue pie. If I had had a lemon meringue pie or something sweet like that, what would it do to my kidneys? And I know my sugar would spike, but I just need some advice. All right. <laughs> Must I stay off it? Excellent, excellent question. Thank you so much for that question. I'd like us to keep that in mind when we talk you know, monitoring of treatment <laughs> with diabetics, all right? Let's get, let's get back to um, Ms. Naitha. Yeah. Yes. So basically from a prevention perspective, um, I'd like to speak more from the obesity perspective because right. we know that obesity is the major problem in this country. Uh, the recent stats, your South African Demographic Health Survey 2016, um, speaks about over 60% of women presenting with overweight or obesity right. and about 30% of men presenting with overweight and obesity. So the Department of Health is actually embarking on a strategy, an obesity strategy to try and curb this problem of obesity right. because basically we know that if we um, tackle the issue of obesity, we automatically going to curb the issues of non-communicable diseases, right. mainly diabetes. Because of that strong association. Mm. In fact, there yes. was this talk of diabetes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. So um, from the perspective of healthy eating um, and, and providing more education to the population at large, but also from the perspective of industry, uh, for as much as we can make people aware of healthier choices, those healthier choices need to be accessible as well. Mm. So we're in consultation with industry to try and reformulate products to reduct, uh, reduce the sugar contents of the products, as well as the reduction of salt. Um, in our products, as well as communication with quick service restaurants to have more healthy food choices available, uh, retailers to have the healthier options more accessible and available as well. So from that perspective, in terms of prevention, we're trying to do a lot um, in preventing obesity. Well, come, back, come back and talk about sugar and sugar tax yes. and all of that. But before that, let's, let's go to Cape Town, or is it Western Cape? Somewhere in the Western Cape and speak to Professor Miller. Now, Prof. Miller, you have a story to tell us about um, rooibos tea and prevention of diabetes. What is the link? <clears throat> yes, I, I think that, um, firstly, uh, in terms of diet, you, you need to increase or move away from processed foods, 
try and increase uh, vegetables, for example, leafy vegetables, uh, increasing the fiber content, but as well as introduce or, or, your, or increase your intake of plant-derived compounds uh, such as phenolic compound. Now, in terms of rooibos, it has several very interesting uh, polyphenolic compounds that we have shown not only uh, improves the way the body handles glucose, but also improves your uh, cardiovascular risk in terms of your your lipid level. So, uh, in terms of, of rooibos itself, we we are working with uh, th making extracts that are enriched in these compounds with the idea of presenting uh, such a product to, uh, to the population at risk. Mm. Very interesting. All right, let's, let's come back to our studio audience here. I'm sure there are some people eager to share their stories with us. Where do we start, yeah? Gentlemen in front. Do we have the microphone? Oh, the lady at the back, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Montembo Toko, and I'm type 2 diabetic. I've had it since 2011. Uh, what I want to ask the endo is, I've recently developed a rash on my hands, and it's, it's, it's a very irritating itch. It's not, it doesn't happen every day. What, it, could it be related to diabetes, or... It's just an allergic reaction. All right. Do you want to just take that one quickly before we go to the next All right. One? Look, I mean, there are some dermatological or skin manifestations of diabetes, and most of them are related to uh, control not being good because, of course, it affects the immune system, so they're more prone to fungal infections and other skin conditions. My advice would be to get your doctor to have a look at it, and he'll see whether it's allergic related or whether it's actually ri directly related to your diabetes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We have somebody else, yeah? Yes, um, my name is Prince. My question to Dr. Barnard is, um, I've, I'm living with one kidney, and I've recently been diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, but the kidney, I lost it about 14 years ago. It has nothing to do with diabetes. Uh, my main concern is, I'm, I'm currently on met, metformin 850, um, and how is that going to affect my kidney in the long run, um, taking into account that I will be taking this for quite some time if the condition is not reversible. Okay. So that's an excellent question. Right. I mean, so the gentleman's got type 2 diabetes. So we know that about 50% of patients with type 2 diabetes normally present with some kind of microvascular complications. So diabetes complicates the body by affecting big vessels, which is macro and the micro. Vascular. So the microvascular will affect the eyes, will affect the kidneys, will affect the feet. And so in your case, the fact that you've got one kidney, your only issue is to make sure that your diabetes is well controlled so that you can keep the microvascular complications at bay as long as possible. And typically this will present, if there's bad control, you know, in 8 to 12 years' time. So your doctor will keep an eye on whether you're leaking protein in your urine and then obviously give you any advice uh, in terms of how you're going to become a bit stricter with control and use certain drugs uh, to delay the onset of it. Certainly glucophage or metformin will not affect your kidney function. Mm. However, once the kidney functions do deteriorate from other causes, mm. then your doctor would have to make a decision and at a certain GFR, which is something that they measure, right. you would have to stop it. But that's, until that point, it's going to really do the probably the best thing uh, for your diabetes. Okay. Is and that's more about it. monitoring and, you know, treatment yeah. and, and, and so on. But let's get back to the prevention story because I think this is quite important. You mentioned earlier, uh, Nolene, the, the issue of sugar, you know, yes. trying to limit sugar. Yes. And we're looking at, obviously, various ways in which you can help people limit sugar yes. intake. Now, just talk, take us through the sugar tax story. How do we think we are achieving success in that or are we likely to achieve success? Uh, well, there's still a lot of discussions going in uh, to the actual implementation and when that is going to happen. 
but uh, the whole point of the sugar tax is to start reformulation as well. That's why I mentioned the discussions with industry. Right. We're wanting to reformulate products rather to decrease the sugar content of the products. Mm. So if there are more products out there with a lower sugar content, then those products don't necessarily need to be taxed. Mm. Um, but it is then obviously uh, from the perspective of having these products or the healthier products available to the consumer. Um, for as long as there are unhealthy products available, then there's a temptation and there's a demand and these products will be available. So we need to look at making these products not available. Okay. So I mean, sugary products or sugary drinks and all of this, these are available everywhere. Everywhere you walk, you will find some sort of sugary drink or some sweet. But practically, how can people avoid these? Okay. So... What I always tell my patients is control. You need to control the amount that you take in. So the caller asked about the le lemon meringue. Mm. If you feel like having lemon meringue, have it. But it's the amount that you'll have that mm. will affect your sugar mm. readings. Mm. So let's say you decide to have maybe two scoops. I'm talking a tablespoon. And then you test your sugars too late, two hours later and you see that your sugar is elevated very high, more than eight millimoles per, per liter. Then two days later, have the same product but half the portion right. and get to a portion that will work for you. Because it's very difficult to tell a person not to eat cake, not to eat, not to take this and that or the fruit or whatever. So it's developing because a unique relationship with food. With food, it? exactly. You Moderation. need to know yeah. the portion that works for you because right. what one portion that works for one patient won't work for the yeah. next patient. Of course, we're talking about those that already have diabetes. Yes. But, yes. But, but, but yeah, it's, it's understood. All right, time for another quick commercial break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion on uh, especially treatment and monitoring and support of diabetes. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill. We'll help you stay well. It's so good. Nothing else can replace. Just your slightest embrace. And if you only would be my own for the rest of my day. I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Bon. If we're talking health, then let's talk seriously. Violence against women, it also talks to such behavior where teachers, instead of educating kids and give them dignity, they strip them of their dignity. The first lady. The first lady, her action, it's just unacceptable. I must say that it cannot be condoned. If I had it my way, I would say we had to act and make sure that she goes to jail. The scourge is not seizing. The angry people, the intolerance, it's so huge. So then that the scourge finds itself within that particular environment. You cannot uh, say that it, it, it's a standalone. Mm. It's influenced by social ills, economic challenges. Join me in Port Sedu live every Monday to Thursday at 17.30. Today on Rights and Recourse, we will unpack the new traditional court mark. The idea of the bill is not to overregulate, uh, to basically set the principles. The most important aspect of this bill is that it understands that customary law by its nature is consensual, that I have a right to affiliate, I have a right therefore to opt in, and I have a right to opt out. The opt out provision is, is basically one that you've got to respect the court in, in the sense of if you've been summoned, you've got to tell the, the clerk of the court at least that you're not willing to attend. The challenge that I would like to throw to the Department of Justice 
It has to ensure, come up with mechanisms of ensuring that people who exercise their right to opt out or to opt in are not in any way victimized. Hashtag rights with Dumila Mates on legal issues every Sunday at 2 o'clock Central African time. Welcome back and thank you so much for staying with us. We're discussing diabetes with Dr. Cindy Banner, endocrinologist, Sister Charmaine Moyo, diabetes nurse educator, and we're joined by Linda Ferns, who is a diabetes, oh, somebody from Diabetes Support <laughs> Group based in Forwards. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank Linda. you. I'm going to come back to you just okay. now, but let's just start talking about treatment. But before we start talking about treatment options, the one issue that we, for, well, we, we omitted uh, in the prevention is the importance of screening and knowing your numbers. Just a quick word on that. So I think there's a big drive for people to attend screening days uh, or go to a doctor and get yourself screened <coughs> and knowing the numbers. And that's about cholesterol, about blood pressure, BMI, which is measure of weight, and then, of course, your glucose levels. Mm. And knowing your numbers will then obviously then make sure that you're tracking them as well. And so ties in well with uh, how we need to control the condition. So, of course, right. central to controlling the diabetes would always be reaffirming at every visit with a patient the need to control weight, the need to maintain good level of activity. We've spoken about it, making <coughs> sure that you're on track with uh, your eating plans. And then, as the doctor mentioned uh, from Cape Town, having your micro and macronutrients from your fruit, vegetables, you know, your five colored fruit and vegetables a day. But in terms of control and medication, so there's a lot of medications that have come onto market now. I mean, in the past, we used to have two oral agents yeah. and we had insulin. Yeah. And the idea was just to try and control uh, the sugar level, okay. glucose. Yeah. And that can be done by keeping a track on a number called HbA1c, mm which is a measure of how well you're controlling your diabetes over a three-month period. And that needs to be routinely checked uh, by your caregiver. How, how often? So it's a measure every three months. So it depends on whether you're in the state. Certainly at Baraguanath Hospital, we measure it two or three times a year. Some of the funders will allow it only twice a year. But uh, it all depends on control. If you're the kind of patient who's well controlled, like Monique uh, spoken, you know, recently she's been controlling herself well, you can probably move those tests uh, 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 further apart. Whereas if you're going through a bad phase, certainly you'd probably want to do it three or four times a year. Okay. But the key thing is to control and keep an eye on it at home because right. these patients will have a tool. Sure. What about home glucose monitoring? Okay. So uh, it depends on what um, agent you're on to control your, your blood sugar. So normally for our oral patients, we'll tell them to test at least three times a week. And then with the patients on insulin, depending on the regimen that they're on, then they would need to test maybe two to three times or even more mm. per day. But the important thing is when you test your sugars, so when you come in we would, to our clinic, we would normally do a download <coughs> of your daily test readings. So we look at those readings and we compare them to the HbA1c. They should tell you. So when you look at an, an HbA1c of, let's say, 10%, it would mean that your sugars are probably... 13 and above, but then you find that someone is testing in the morning only when they wake up and the sugars are always 7. Mm. So that means there's some times where the sugars are high. Okay. So that's when we'd ask them to test a little bit more. So it's important when you're monitoring your sugars, yeah. don't concentrate on one time only. Sure. Test at different times different so that times. when you pick up high mm. readings, yeah. then you test a little bit more to find out what's happening. Linda, people yep. with diabetes need support groups. Mm -hmm. You, from one of Sub, sub diabetes support groups. How I many think do we have? I think I'm probably the only one, hmm. and I only started it last month. Why is that? What, okay, what, what drove you to start it, number one? Um, I'm 55 years old. I was diagnosed type 2 probably about 15 years ago. Went in, on to insulin about 10 years ago. I can't take metformin or glucophage. Makes me violently sick. I can't sometimes, can't even get out of bed. So I only take insulin and I inject four times a day and I test four times a day. Um, but I just found that 
there's just such a lack of information. Mm. And because the internet is so widely, it's got so much stuff, there's a lot of stuff that's actually conflicting. Right. What works for me doesn't necessarily work for mm. somebody else. Mm. Um, what works for me in diet doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. So, I've had so to what do you do then in a diabetes support group? It's about communication and sharing. Um, so I can share my experience with somebody else and I can possibly learn from that other person. Mm. Um, trying new things. One of my biggest challenges is not knowing what to eat if I'm recording a very high reading or a very low reading. Mm. Um, I had woke up the other day, I was just saying earlier, 5.2 sugar, I was over the moon, it's my waking into reading and I was great, it was like normal. Had breakfast, scrambled egg, ever, cup of coffee, milk, no sugar, literally half a yogurt. One hour later, my sugar was 20.2. Mm. So what do I eat at 5.2? I have no idea. And if my sugar is, my reading is 20, what do I eat and what do I inject? So where my dosage is 20 units of the fast acting one and 40 units of the slow acting one at night, it's never ever going to be that because it depends entirely on my reading and what am I supposed to be eating. So the support group is really just about opening up and sharing those experiences and understanding the struggles that everybody else has. <clears throat> you know what? I just wish that we had all the time to discuss this very important uh, beauty uh, subject. But thank you so much to all my guests, Prof. Sindip, uh, Dr. Sindip Bana, <laughs> Sister Charmaine Moyo, Linda Femmes, and of course our studio audience. I'd love to have spoken to everybody, but just did not have enough time. For. Folks, that's all we have for you today. And join us again next week, same time, on SABC2 and Channel 404. And until then, from me, Dr. Salomon Daung, it's a goodbye, and please do take care.